Good afternoon and welcome to the SAIT Mental Toughness webinar. My name is Lauren Bishop. I am a Client Development Manager in the SAIT Corporate Training Department. Okay, Jenny. So today we're talking about a very pertinent topic uh, while we try to navigate our new reality, mental toughness. This has always been a popular course that you have taught face to face. And now more than ever, we really need to discover our individual mental toughness. Can you start telling us how to do this? Absolutely. Thanks, Lauren, and welcome, everybody. It's great to be joining you again, albeit from the uh, home office in, as you just put it, our new reality. So mental toughness, our conversation for today, and we need it more than ever. Uh, the reality that is hugging us each every day is that heavy ambiguity, the constant change. Um, we're splitting our attention and our performance between work and homeschooling, parenting, uh, life and our homes just in general. And there's a lot of stuff going on within there. And just to kick off, as Lauren had mentioned, we're gonna use Menti. So we'll put it to the test so everyone can get familiar with it right now. You know, we see some coming in already. So there's lots of unknowns, lots of uncertainty. The government, those of you who have elderly family members to care from, that makes a big difference as well. This is kind of fun. We have over 100 people on here at the moment. So there's a lot of words going to come right in and make this uh, big word cloud for us. Uncertainty is obviously the, the big one for everybody, and that's difficult to deal with. A lot of anxiety out there. Some of you in here as leaders, not just yourself, but also the team that you're working with too. And you might be a leader of your family, like parenting is being a leader as well. So we've slowed down a little bit there. Oh, still coming. I'm loving that we're seeing the word balance in there. That's great. And the fact that it stands out means a few people have got that piece within there. We'll just let those words settle a little bit more. So we know that with all this going on, this is sort of where we're sitting at the moment. And often when we're facing a big stress, it's just that it's there in that patch of time. The problem with here and now is that uncertainty and that length that we're dealing with it. I'm going to move this slide on, which means if you didn't get your words in, you'll have to take part in the next Mentimeter when we use it. Thank you so much for everybody who did pop those words in there. We're able to save this. It's all anonymous. And we'll make sure that we share those results with you later on as well. So Jenny, physical toughness is, an e is easy to define. We can see it. Um, but mental toughness, we can't see. And so how do we define it? And how is it different? Or is it different from being resilient? Yeah, and I love that question, Lauren. In my excitement, I've shown you all the definition of mental toughness already. So probably most of you have had a chance to read through that. A lot of people often equate the two, mental toughness and resilience side by side. Um, maybe it's just because we have two different courses at SAID that I put them in different buckets. Um, I like to think of mental toughness, it's just you. It's your mind. And this is about your mental agility. Whereas resilience has many, many more components to it and so if your mental toughness is this your resilience is sort of the umbrella that hangs over you typically when we've got longer than half an hour mental toughness we're including commitment challenge control confidence those kind of areas today we're just going to look at some nudges in three key areas that will hopefully allow you to set yourself up for success find a better version or just find some some calm and some control in all that chaos that's going on so as Lauren mentioned at the beginning, we'll take a few moments to look at how to find calm and get back to a starting point. I'm going to talk about that little voice that chats to you during the day. Uh, if you're wondering which little voice, it's the one that just said to you, which little voice. And then we'll also talk about enabling your environment and how you can set yourself up easily for success on a daily basis. One of the things to remember when we're talking about mental toughness is that it is not a gift that's just given to some people. We all have it. And we all um, have the ability to strengthen it and develop it. We just need to recognize what it is that's not serving us, make some adjustments, and then here's the hard bit. We've got to stick with those small, consistent adjustments. As you can see at the top there, we can grow what our mind does. We can develop that. It's just like a muscle. 
when I started running, I couldn't run 10K. Actually, I still can't run 10K, but my muscles are growing to help me to do that better. It used to be dreadful in difficult conversations with a lot of practice and a lot of small nudges. I now handle them. They're still difficult, but I handle them differently and it's easier for me to be a part of that. This will surprise some of you on the other end, but I used to hate presentations. It scared the heebie-jeebies out of me. And now, typically, they're a lot easier and I actually have fun doing them. It's all consistent little actions that have helped us to get there. Now, just before I let Lauren in again, let's uh, take another Mentimeter here and find out from you, given the choice, where would you have or where would you develop greater mental toughness? And remember, nothing can be attached to this. It's just a void. You're sending your answer out there. We can't say, oh, so-and-so said this. It just allows us to see and sort of feel that we're not alone with everybody else dealing in there. So we can see family up on the screen already. Crisis, family matters, work, home. And it's interesting how some of us feel that we've got it nailed at work. We don't do as well under our home roof. And that's a little bit curious as we've moved into that world of having to do um, our work at home. And now the two have sort of collided together. You should be able to scroll down here. Negotiations is another one that comes up quite often. Yes, those are difficult to manage for some people. Relationships, handling being alone. That's, you know, some of us are working, there's five of us in this house, it is busy. And other people are by themselves trying to do their work as well. Public speaking, I hear you. Yep. <laughs> handling stress, in fact, yes. Overthinking, dealing with uncertainty. And just as I hopefully scroll through this slow enough for you, you can see in there with the repeats that we have, we're all not alone. It is something that we're all dealing with, all trying to build more and more often. Yeah, Jenny, there's lots of common themes there that I think uh, we can all relate to in some capacity. So when looking at those, you know, control is something most of us want to have all the time in all aspects of our lives. How do we find control in this current madness? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and one that's um, sitting with a lot of us on a, on a daily basis. How do we find that control? How do we find that present peace? The first thing to be aware of is as an adult, we can speak from or think from, actually think from, three different places. So we can fixate ourselves in the past and that's actually useful sometimes because you can learn from the past. But more often or not, when we're in a time of uncertainty, ambiguity, all those other great pieces we've just talked about, what we do is we regret that we didn't do this. We didn't get that done. It didn't go well. The other option at the other end of the continuum is in the future. And that's useful too. Sometimes when we want to strategize, set our vision, make a plan, set a goal, we want to lift our heads up and look out into the future. But unfortunately, when we're sitting in times like this, what we find is that we're worrying or we're being anxious due to perceived threats. So neither of those is really very useful when we feel like everything's a little bit crazy. So if we want to get back to that starting point, being in control, finding the calm, we have to hit present. And present's really interesting because when we're present, there's no fear. It's impossible to have fear if you're actually focusing on right here, right now. So a couple of ways that we can find that present bit, the, eas the easiest ones, I think, to use. And the first one, and some people refer to it as grounding. Some people refer to it as mindful centering. It's called 54321. And typically it runs with the senses. So to start with, sitting where you are, you would label five things that you can see. And I really would suggest that you do this out loud, even by yourself. It's okay to talk to yourself. So I would label five things that I can see. And then four things that I can feel, four different things that you can feel. So I might feel the sleeve on my arm, my feet on the carpet, whatever it is. So five things you can see, four things you can feel, three things that you can hear in your environment around, again, labeling it out loud, two things you can smell, if you can smell two different things. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And then the last one, one good thing about you. 
Yeah, you gotta look at yourself. Here's one good thing about me. Five, four, three, two, one. And it's incredible the way that that brings you into that centered moment, brings you present and ready to do whatever it is, have the conversation, do the project, um, whatever that piece may be. Another piece that can help us to be present is what we want to do is sort of shift our attention. So when we get a little bit into chaos, we're overthinking, the worry spiral started, our minds are racing frantically, and we kind of get caught in our head. And so what we want to do is come out of our head. And the, one of the easiest ways to do that is take your thumb and your forefinger and just rub them together gently. Now, it seems a little bit strange, but if you concentrate on doing that, you can actually feel the ridges on your finger and it shifts the attention in your brain away from the crazy right here to the present. And this is quite useful as well. Often when people are feeling a little bit anxious or they're worrying, the first thing that you hear is breathe. Now, it's good advice. We'll talk about breathing in a minute. We all should breathe. But if you're in that state, breathing is actually quite difficult and it's hard to control your breath. So actually doing this first or concentrating on the feel of something else, it might be how does the carpet feel under my feet if you have carpet on your floor or the hardwood floor, just some other physical sensation before you focus on the breathing. The last one too, it would be wrong for us not to talk about breathing. When you're anxious, when you're worrying, when everything's going crazy, you get a big dump of all those grumpy hormones so cortisol the stress hormone adrenaline all those other yucky pieces that just they don't help us and they don't help us to think straight they don't give us any clarity they actually make it all worse and so what we need to do is to get rid of that as much as we can and breathing gives us a good dose of fresh oxygen and allows us to start to get that clarity within there no, for me, it's the three. I mean, I constantly hear my children, so I count down quite a bit. Um, but I get to the three and it's the negative self dialogue starts to go into overdrive. Yeah, absolutely. And you're not alone. I'm going to bring my screen back up here just because this next slide makes me giggle. So the top one you can see on the left hand side of your screen, negative Nelly. That's what I call mine. Um, a little voice that just runs away. Dan Harris in his uh, book app, everything that's followed on from it, 10% happier, refers to it as the inner critic. Many people just call it that voice. I had a gentleman in uh, a classroom one time. He goes, oh, yes, Jenny, it's Dr. Doom. He follows me everywhere. Um, some people actually refer to it as their ego because often when that voice jumps up, it is our own egos getting in our way. And negative Nelly, as I would call her, she's troublesome she just never stops talking and what's interesting is the way that she's ratting on behind there let's uh let's interact with the people who are out there as well when you think about your little voice if you have one i'm pretty sure most of us do what's that voice um saying to you how is that voice so if you truly are like what in a voice jenny you're going to vote for that one We've got a couple out there who are hanging with me, the critic and always squawking. It's a real negative Nelly. That might be a nice, uh, nice word for her. If you're popping your uh, votes in that, sometimes nice to me. Excellent. We're one step along the way there to sorting that out. We might be running neck and neck soon, actually. There's somebody out there, a couple of people out there who have never been aware of that little rhetoric that's running in the back there. <laughs> Interestingly, not many voices that are always kind and always helpful. And I'll give it, I'll let it run for a few minutes so we can get some of the, the votes in there. The problem with that voice in the back of our heads, the, the negative Nelly, as I like to call her, is the speed that she can put me into that box of shame. And the reason that she can do that is because she's very judgmental. She's very good at saying, Jenny, you're not good enough for that. Jenny, why on earth would you be a part of that conversation? You don't have the intelligence to belong there. You don't have the skills to do this. Uh, she deals very well with fear. She can create a magnificent story in seconds. Those of you who have hung out in the classroom have probably heard my story about how when my son hurt his shoulder, I'd written off his entire life in 30 seconds because Nellie had created this wonderful story of what would happen next. It was all rubbish. He was fine. 
Um, she's not very empathetic either. Never prepared to just hang out with you and, and lean into those emotions as they need to or, you know, would be justified to be. She's great at blaming me. And goodness gracious, if I feel I failed, she will turn that into a massive event. And so, you know, my Nelly, these days I would hang into that sometimes nice to me because I've been working with her. We'll talk about how to do that in a minute. But she started right on that right hand side as well. So I think that when we're looking at these voices or this voice that hangs out in our head, this is a crucial element. And if your rhetoric, your inner voice, whatever you want to call it, is loud and it isn't helpful, this could be the biggest secret, I think, to shifting your mindset, strengthening your mental toughness and really improving your way forward. <clears throat> a couple of ways that we can start to change this piece. Number one is to really get to know that voice. Listen carefully. Some of you may not have been aware of it before. It's kind of a dull piece that just keeps going. Uh, it is sneaky. It will tell you one minute that you should be doing this and the next minute, what on earth are you doing thinking you would do that? Um, Jenny, you should present more on a public platform. Jenny, why would you publish that? Nobody wants to read it. Coming from the same place is not helpful. But when I get to know it, I become more of an observer. And so I'm listening far more carefully to what the voice is saying. And I actually find myself challenging that voice because a lot of that voice that runs in the back of our head is thoughts. So we've just created this piece and how we create them comes from our story. And sadly, we don't have time to even get into that today. But a lot of what you say to yourself is based on a whole load of beliefs and thoughts that you've constantly created. There's actually no truth and no fact in there. And when we pay attention, then we can shift out, okay, this is real. This one I don't know about, and this is absolute rubbish. I'm not hanging on to that. In fact, I'm just going to flick that away. It's not part of it. The other key piece, as per that last Mentimeter, is how are you talking to yourself? And this is a really good question. Uh, Lauren, you mentioned you have children hanging out in that house with you. We have three kids in here. And when, I'm, when Nellie's having a go at me, and I often I listen hard to that, I think, would I talk like that to one of our children? The answer is no, I would never speak to them the way that I think I can speak to myself. If you don't have children, how do you speak to your best friend? How do you speak to somebody that you love? If you're not being as nice to you as you would be to them, that's really not fair on you. And you're in charge of that piece. You know, we have 100% control over what we say to ourselves. We have 100% control over what we focus on. So that's a bit that we can easily change. If you don't like the way you're talking to yourself, change it and change that tape, change Nellie's tune. Um, the self-compassion really is what that's all about. And so it's possible for me to appreciate my intelligence, but want to learn more. It's possible for me to like the body I'm in, but want to improve it. We can still develop, but we can be kind to ourselves in the process. A couple of other things that we can do to help with Nelly is think about the language that we're using. We've just said we control what we think. And so listen to how you're talking. If you start your day with, I have to teach grade six math. I have to do this report. I have to create this session and I don't want to. I have to phone my mom. I have to do this. I have to do that. Before you even start your day, you're whew, tired. But actually, if I change that language and put some meaning to it, how about I want to? I want to help my child with their homeschool or with their math because that's going to allow them to still have some semblance of normal and it's going to give us some one-on-one -on -one time. I want to create this report or I want to create this session so that we can deliver another great event for people. I want to phone my mom. She makes me feel good. I get that connection. And then I'm in a much better place. I'll call you later, mom, I promise. Um, and so by changing it from I have to to I want to, now it's not as tiring. It's not as stressful. Stress is a negative reaction to pressure, which would suggest we could have a different one, a positive reaction to it. The last piece to talk about with Nelly, that voice, whatever you want to call it, is this idea of worry. 
And worry exists when we feed it. And we can feed worry by excessive social media, by mm -hmm. watching the news the whole time, by ruminating on negative events, by discounting the positive, all those kind of areas. And when we feed it, it thrives. So actually what we want to do is allow it to fade. Don't feed it. Find the anchor point, come back to present, come back to calm, and then figure out what is the next action that I can do that is completely in my control and allows me to take one step further forwards. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, we had the TV running on news. I felt 24 seven when everything first started happening back in the middle of March. And now it's to the point where we put it on for the evening news and take our information and leave it at that because it just became too much for us. So these are really great steps for us, but how do we implement this every day to make it happen to really strengthen that mental toughness? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point. And, and there may be quite a few people out there who, um, where are we now, about two months ago would have said, yeah, my mental toughness is, is good. I've been working on this. I, I've got this sorted. And now four or five, what are we now, six or seven weeks into this, you begin to think, did I really? Like this is mm -hmm. really stretching me. This is pushing me. And so I think the, um, the key is setting up your environment. How do we enable ourselves to, um, to have that better start every day? So one of the, or two key pieces actually, one is this isn't a badge that you just get to wear. This is consistent, continuous actions. And I absolutely would tell you in the last six or seven weeks, there have been days, there have been times where I felt myself hanging out in a place that's not comfortable, doesn't feel good, and that worry spiral really taking off. Um, I think that one of the ways to help that is attach a meaning, put a focus, put a value on there. We're all dealing with an awful lot of grief and uncertainty and so meaning allows us to sort of make that shift and make that connection. Yeah, those are, it's, you know, we work on our physical fitness. We also have to work on our mental fitness as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll just connect with um, another piece in there. And this, this seems to be popping up a lot is we, we talk about grief. I just mentioned it in there and a lot of people will be like, well, I haven't, I haven't lost anybody from COVID and, and our, you know, sincere sympathies to anybody on this call who may have, but there's another grief that, that we're all a part of. In fact, there's two, one is a collective grief and collectively we're grieving the loss of normal. Okay? Life will never be as it was before. So that's kind of a tricky place for us to hang out. There's a certain amount of fear. What will the economic um, impact of all of this be? And here in Alberta, we're dealing with not just the COVID and the quarantine, but also that oil and gas price as well. Um, and the loss of connection. And whilst we've all got quite good at this, I'm now brave and I turn my camera on every day but I would still miss that face-to-face -face connection and just, you know, truly hanging out with people where I get my energy and where I feel good from. And the other grief that we're dealing with as well is the anticipatory grief. We don't know what the future looks like. One of um, my children asked me yesterday, what, what happens when we go back to school? Do we just go back to school? And actually here, I think the CBE released, there were three different options there was no real sort of clarity or certainty in there anymore. There was just three options. So we have that anticipatory piece as well. That's difficult. So a couple of things that we can do. Number one, and this is in fact none of them, is that idea of gratitude. So with gratitude, the classic one goes back to Siegelman's research, is think of three things as you start your day that you're grateful for. Now, thinking about it will make a difference. You're changing the hormones. Your brain's going to feel better. If you can write down those three things that you're grateful for, it has an even greater impact as well. But I also like the idea of, you know, when you're thinking of, who you're, who, of what you're grateful for, if there's a who in there, send them a text, drop them a line, send them an email, and really fulfill that connection piece and pass on that gratitude and that joy piece within there you'll feel good writing it they'll feel fantastic receiving it and that's a win-win out there 
One of the other pieces, and we've talked about this already, is uh, self-compassion. And so being, being kind to yourself, be patient. Okay, be patient with yourself, be patient with the people around you. I was talking to a group this morning about change leadership and that classic change curve and the fact that most of us are dealing with five of those curves all at once. That requires some patience. People need time in the day to suddenly be a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> most people didn't sign up for that. There's a reason those people have that job. So we've got to have that kindness. We've got to have that patient piece as well. And sometimes that requires us just to stop reset, figure out where we're at, and then change that frame that we're working from. And the last piece I would say within there, and I've mentioned it just briefly, is the connection. Know who your support crew are. Who are the people that make you feel good? Who are the people that make you laugh? Um, find them, I was going to say hang out with them, but connect with them might be the better version at the moment. And, and just, you know, turn your cameras on, pick up the phone. If you're in a position where you know you can stand and be the X amount of feet away from each other, do that because then we start to, to feel better. And I, um, I often equate it to, you know, if this is your life and I have filled it half full on purpose. It's half full, not half empty, of course. All the things that we've talked about are tiny nudges. But if you take those tiny nudges, and I'm really hoping this doesn't work and I don't spill it on my desk. But if you take those tiny nudges and just put them into your day, there we go, there's about three or four of those nudges in your day. I don't know if we can see that. If you can see it, it's completely changed the color of the water. And so now that's a much better place to develop from, play from, grow in, hang out in than just in that sort of bleh, regular. So just a couple of nudges a day and we'll be making those steps towards success. Oh, that's great, Jenny. Some, some stuff to think about, right? And you know, how do, we, how do we realize what we need to do to take care of ourselves when we are so busy taking care of all these new, I will call them adventures um, mm -hmm. in the, the time of COVID. Um, but now we're gonna do some Q and A. So the first one is, how do you distinguish between inner voice and gut? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's really by awareness and taking that time to, to be at one with yourself. And so the two actually work very close together. If your gut feeling is this is a great idea and the inner voice is saying, don't be silly, of course that's not a good idea. So pay attention, where is that inner voice message coming from and what might be the, the reason behind that? So we, if it's a thought, you've attached it to something. Um, it, it's difficult without knowing sight or situation, but often we will join the dots very strangely. So you might've seen something on a Netflix drama somewhere that's caused you to say that's not a good idea because this is what happened in the Netflix show. Well, obviously that's not helpful. If you have a past experience or somebody does that says this isn't a good idea because of this, then you've got a much better connection where you can do some more investigation and have a conversation. So I, I feel like the real answer to that is, is sort of awareness and question the thought process. What's making you second guess yourself, if you like, in that inner voice. Uh, your next question is, how do you know when to ask for help? That is a good question. Generally, as adults, we're dreadful for asking for help. So I would suggest that if you're thinking, I need some help, that's the time when you need to ask for help. And out there, whether it's in the workplace or in your home life, there's a big need for a mind shift here. For the longest of time, asking for help has been seen as a weakness. It's not a weakness at all. And in fact, most people when they're asked are so grateful to help, to support, um, especially if they're part of your support network. So I would say that the second you hear that I need help, go ask for help and, and look to the people who you know, you genuinely can reach out to as your starting place. Don't leave it yeah. too late for sure. Yeah. It's okay not to be okay. Yeah. I think is one of the slogans out there for mental yeah, health. Absolutely. And, yeah. Um, I have a comment question here. I lead a group of people and how do I maintain my energy level, motivation, hope to support others that are in this time? 
I think you've, uh, whoever, and thank you to whoever put that statement in there, you've answered it in it. Um, it's about making time for you. And one of the downsides that we're seeing with this work from home is people are working 16 and a half hour days. And not only are they working longer days, two to three hours on average longer, we were already working long hours before, but they're also trying to ensure that their kids are on top of the schooling piece in a great place uh, and be their, their home roles or whatever else they had going on there. And so it is absolutely crucial that you're finding and making time for yourself. And whether that is a 20 minute walk, um, practicing meditation, mindfulness, just space for you in the day. Um, and the other piece too, if you're a leader of a team is having those open conversations. And if your energy is flat one day, it's okay to own that. Lauren just said it. It's okay not to be okay. Um, but as a leader, you're, you're a role model. So, you know, my energy's right down. I'm struggling today, but here's what I'm going to do to try and bring it back again. Oh, that's great. Uh, next question is, what are the best techniques to tell yourself, convince yourself to not worry or drop the things you are unable to control? <laughs> that's a good question it is a really good question and probably i don't know where uh what have we got 119 people are chiming in but i can see all these little dots sort of around us all going yes um okay worry and anxiety are usually based on perceived threats so the key in there is the perception piece so number one what do i have that's real Okay, what is the realistic piece? And if you don't know the answer to that, can you ask somebody? Because that Nellie will create a great story and she'll create a great story based on a whole load of rubbish, basically. So number one is what, what's causing that? What, am I creating a story? Because if you suddenly write it down, you know, I'm worried about this, this, and then you look at it and you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's just not worth worrying about. That's an easy way to do it. Um, number two, and I don't know if it was part of the question, I can't see the questions, but you mentioned there, Lauren, things that we can't control and we can't control them. There's a reason that, you know, we have that saying control the controllables. And the only thing that you can control is yourself. So, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, I, I don't know what my life will look like. I may not get to hang out in a classroom, which is you know, my joy de vivre for a long, long time, but what's in my control is how I set myself up and how I learn for this new version. And so by taking active steps towards making that better, my worry has diminished around being back in a classroom and getting back there straight away. So use whatever you need to get yourself back to present, make a list of what's bugging you, what's in your control, what's not in your control. The not in your control is not in your control. In your control, what will you do next that will have impact and value? I don't have control over the construction that's happening outside my house. So my apologies if that is disrupting everyone. A uh, great question here is part of mental toughness is taking time for yourself. How do you ask for this time from family, especially elderly family members? There's a number of things and it would depend on, on the whole story within there. But I think underlying here is this idea of boundaries. And, you know, you've just heard me say that statistics are showing us that people are working 16 and a half hour days, plus, plus, and plus. And that's pure evidence that we don't have boundaries in place. And it's not sustainable. Like there are going to be some very, very significant problems if people try and keep going at the pace that they're going at. So, um, one is, is setting those boundaries. And if you're dealing with elderly people or you're caring for elderly people and they need your attention, it might be vice versa too, maybe with kids and, and children as well, is to figure out what you think works for you. And I say what you think because you might try it for a while and, and that's not working too. And then you've got to practice that whole agility thing and change it again. But the key is there, and it was in the question again, is have the conversation. Hey, in order to be able to be here to provide and to care to the best of my ability, I have to have some time for me in the day. 
And and when we come from a place of kindness, a place of love, you know, I I love you and I want to care for you here, but I have got to have this hour or this time. Then we're in a in a better conversation. That's great advice. You know, if you don't ask for it, you can't necessarily get it. And I think yes. everyone understand everyone needs their own alone time right now we're stuck in homes we're 24 7 with the people we hopefully love so um time away is it's okay um another great question do you have strategies on how i can motivate my team who are all working remotely during the pandemic yes (laughs) i feel like that's almost a webinar of its own um it's a it's a much longer conversation i would um to cut a very long answer short, you can't motivate your team. Only they can motivate themselves. But what you can do is provide conditions that will help them to motivate themselves. And those conditions at the moment, I would suggest, are connection. So are you having daily connection? And, and a lot of people, what they did is, is they wanted to check that box. So they're having a virtual team huddle in the morning, but they're still all talking about work and shifting and what's awful out there. Well, that's not really a useful connection piece. So do you have a social connection piece with your team? It doesn't have to be an hour. It might just be 20 minutes. It might be 10 minutes. Are you doing something different in that social connection piece? One of the dangers in our current setup is that we try and repeat what we did in the way that we're working now. So, you know, those of you who have hung out with me in a classroom, I cannot replicate that in this piece. So I've got to change that up and work, find out different ways to do that. Um, so one would be the connection. The second one would be meaning and purpose. And so does your team have meaning and purpose behind the actions that they're doing? And are you reinforcing that piece? Number three, you can ask them if they're not very motivated how things are going that comes back into that connection and really knowing your team within there as well and then the last one is support we absolutely need support so if you're a leader that i've got your back mentality and my job is to help you look brilliant mentality that's really going to help your people if they're not getting that that might cause their engagement motivation to drop somewhat Two more questions, Jenny. Um, The relaunch of our economy is another major shift that's about to happen in our lives. How do we mentally prepare to deal with all the what ifs associated with this relaunch? Yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky. And I like actually what's in that question is the what if. So curiosity, I think curiosity helps to reduce anxiety and worry because we can ask questions. So we get enough information and we want to be curious about that information. Talk to your leader, talk to your colleagues. How does this sit with you? What do you think the way forward will be? What will this look like? One of the curious pieces that we're dealing with is we don't know. We don't know what school will look like when we go back. We don't know what our workplaces will look like. We just simply know it won't be like it was in February of this year. So be curious and be realistic. So don't let Nelly go off into a great story about how dreadful this will all be because we don't know that. So be curious towards it. And, you know, this, this is scaring me. Great. Have a conversation about that. Why is it scaring you? What are the pieces behind there that you're worried about? And that then becomes easier to break it down. Our last question is, how can you help someone struggling with their inner voice? It's a good question. And again, I great questions. I'm kind of excited by this. So somebody else's inner voice is their inner voice. And you can only really deal with what you're hearing. So, for example, uh, two out of three of our kids are teenagers. In fact, all three of them do it. And they might come up with, um, a statement, I'm, I'm not good enough, I'm not going to do this. And so there's a flag right there. You know, my, my mum voice would say, well, of course you're good enough, come on. But the fact that they're saying I'm not good enough means they've got something going on in here. So my question to them might be, what is it that makes you think you're not good enough for this? What do you feel that you're missing? And to answer whoever's question it was, it's really taking the time to have the dialogue It's difficult because some of it becomes a little bit awkward. But if you're a leader and somebody says, I just can't do this. 
the answer might be, that's not actually what I was thinking. I think you're quite capable. What's, what's holding you back? What's stopping you from thinking that you can do it? So just gently, again, it's the gentle nudges on the flags, on the pieces that you're hearing. When you start to listen to people's language, you can hear when it's Nelly playing or when it's Jenny talking. Yeah, that's great. And I think we can relate to each other a lot right now. You know, we talked about collective grief. You know, this is new for a lot of us. So um, I think when people bring the conversations up, we can relate in some context. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, on the on the screen here, for those who want to take a, a quick screenshot or something, I think I saw flashes of Kim popping some information in the chat <laughs> as well. So if you haven't looked at the chat, you might find some extra stuff in there too. But in sort of summary there, that's what we've talked about today. And I know, Lauren, you're going to finish this off with how to get hold of us if you'd like some more information. Yeah, so really the next steps is um, just to keep an eye out in your email for a surprise next week that will be coming out. Uh, we will have this mental toughness topic available in a four hour virtual delivery very soon, um, as we're also working on other applied management courses um, that deal with, you know, really uh, the personal development um, for those that are interested. Um, so you can get a hold of us at uh, corporate training. Um, you can see the email is on your screen right now. Um, so reach out to that and you, you can get put in touch with um, myself or my great team. Um, we're more than happy to help you through this. So Jenny, thank you for your wisdom on this very important subject. And to all of you for taking the time to be with us this afternoon for this webinar. We wish you nothing but safety and health. Uh, and that's both mentally and physically. Absolutely. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. And have a great day. Have a super day. Bye-bye.